Okay, so back in Jersey after uh, a world win, back to Portland on Friday, St. Valentine's Day, recorded early morning on Friday, and then back in Portland on Saturday, and then I'm back in Jersey in the um, in the room. You know, I, I don't know that I mentioned it. I don't think I have it real quickly. I'm going to say that it's um, it's sort of interesting that, you know, 10th anniversary, <clears throat> recording these, um, reading uh, the, uh, the experiments, the phenomenological meditations that were written 10 years ago, and also celebrating what would be 30 years ago. Um, my first sort of introduction, formal introduction to uh, philosophy or formal uh, uh, first encounter with philosophy as a formal field of study. Something about the formal I'm trying to get at because I, you know, for me, I've been doing philosophy or feel like I've been called to do philosophy since I was very young. Very, very young. Um, I would say um, as young as four or five. I'm not sure exactly how old I was when I had that first. Um, experience sort of a awakening if you will to being really was a, uh, a, a sort of a vision of, of probably the first time that my mind had a con the concept of infinity entered my mind and it really blew me away and but that feeling I had um, and it was just right down the hill there um, at the uh, at the town uh, town deli um, in the parking lot there <laughs> while my mom went into the deli to get some some food um, that I had that experience, and um, it's interesting because on the way in, on the train in, I was um, was working on some of this paper that I'm working on now, and I'm going to be um, focusing a bit now. At this, this paper is on Nietzsche. Well, it's not on Nietzsche, but I'm using Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy to get at um, to get at actually the experience, you know, that opened up the genre. And I don't know that I mentioned it. In the preceding um, meditation that I recorded, I might have, because I've been working on this paper now, going back a week. Um, I'm going to be um, presenting it uh, at the end of the month uh, at the American Philosophical Association in Chicago at a session organized by uh, my colleague Sam Rocha. And anyway, um, I'm at the sort of the last part of the paper, and the paper, as I've mentioned before, is exploring a sort of new what I, what I want to say is this sort of new genre, um, taking Nietzsche's um, category of the music-making Socrates, which is something I've been thinking about now for a couple of years, um, and pre presented on it, written on it, and really, it, it the music-making uh, Socrates is a figure that represents uh, a new possibility in terms of writing uh, philosophy and doing philosophy and practicing philosophy. And uh, I've sort of talked about that in the past two years as the project of originary thinking, going back all the way to 2011. And um, this writing that I did 10 years ago, you know, and even before, but certainly which was the, the, the work that happened in this experiment is, uh, I'd like to say, that, that work of originary thinking and that part of that project of originary thinking that I'm now um, sort of, I don't want to say categorizing, but I guess uh, formalizing uh, what, it, what it's about. So the work now after being in Learning's publication is the work that's trying to um, articulate the genre. Um, and the genre really is the work that arises in the era of uh, music making philosophy. That's that's the thesis, and that's what I'm working on. So um, it's sort of here in this room, you know, the when I last um, inhabited this space um, um, when I was a, a high school student. It's sort of interesting to be recording a lot of the first meditations here because. You know, it was in 1984, in the spring of 94, uh, 84, that I was introduced um, to the study of philosophy um, in my, by my high school teacher, actually, Ron Kaplow. Um, and we studied some Kant, and we studied some of the Epicureanism, Epicureanism, Stoicism. You know, sort of, you know, we went through different schools of uh, ancient uh, philosophy and uh, then some modern um, stuff as well. And that's when I 
absolutely sort of understood that what I needed to do was to go and study philosophy. And so I'd already sort of knew going into um, Fordham um, that I was going to be um, studying philosophy. And coincidentally, I got I received my letter of acceptance from Fordham in February of 1984. So February, which is also the month I was born in, is I suppose a significant month um, for me. Uh, and incidentally, and the last point I'm going to make on this sort of pre um, preliminary uh, comments before I read uh, the meditation is that I um, the uh, I checked up, and indeed this is the year Chinese New Year of uh, 4711. And I mention this because, as I said in the last um, meditation, towards the end, that at um, at a certain point. Um, not not too far into the work in, in 2004, I started to record um, the meditations numerically um, based on the that year of 4701, the Chinese year of 4701. So, you know, in February, that's when the Chinese New Year uh, happens. And so, again, February. But I thought because it's in February and because this is all getting underway and happening in February, it's best if I... Um, if I... Um, you know, use this this year 4701 as the as the year the the the, the as a way of categorizing the meditations. So um, the meditation that I wrote 10 years ago today would have been 4701-1602. And I guess I should read where we let where I left off, which was a series of questions, because the next the meditation. So I ended 4701.05.02 with the following questions. In what sense is evocative speech poetic? Why is teachability communicated through a message of possibility? And what is this message? Where does it come from? What is the original source of these enjoining injunctions? And so I begin the next day. These questions are significant and can be likened to so many paths that ultimately may bring us to that space from whence came the originary injunction that enjoins us in poetic dialogue. They lead into that place called a clearing, where the proper mode of attunement is understood to be the letting be of beings. In the opening section, Attunement stood for this letting be. Here, we continue to revisit the turning so that we might ultimately engage the phenomena itself that turns us around. Recognizing this might appear hasty or presumptuous, we qualify this last statement by cautioning against the anticipation that we aim for some climactic moment where the being beyond beings will be revealed. This is not promise nor can it be. For it is not a this or a that we may encounter unless we understand the this or that as a specific kind of posture or comportment or mode of or mode or bearing as in direction. The clearing we anticipate is a situation, a context that establishes certain conditions for the possibility of what we have been calling evocative speech. The clearing is the location of learning, where letting learning happen is directed. Above, we spoke of Socrates as an exemplar of learning because he placed himself at the center or in the midst of the excess of being. By placing himself in this draft, this current, we said, he allowed himself to be drawn into the condition of being. Here, we sense the opportunity to begin to place even more emphasis on the draft that Socrates placed himself in. And in doing so, shift the emphasis from Socrates' apparent willing so that his placing is not so much a matter of his decision, but a matter of a decisive directive that located him, caught him in the way a current tows and even throws us. 
The clearing is a powerful tide that captures us and compels us to let go and let be. It releases us into learning, which is identified as the reaching out through speech, communication, expression to the other. Socrates, as we will explore in a moment, was not so much unlike the poets with whom he was often characterized as by Plato as being in opposition. That is, if we understand this opposition to be placed before us as a choice of models. Even if we understand the opposition of Socrates and the poets as a dialectical tension, a kind of contradiction that we must overcome in order to discover a philo-poetic synthesis, we still miss the essential meaning of their encounter, because their contrast has been achieved through the placing into relief the unique responses that each philosopher and poet has made to the injunction that has been issued to them. As we will see, what distinguishes Socrates from the poet, for example, Ion, is his doubt that the injunction was specifically intended for him. So where both recognized they were being called, Socrates' response cast doubt upon the message and the messenger, and in doing so placed him and those he encountered on the unstable ground where only dialogue can capture the uncertainty, unpredictability, and openness that characterizes the clearing. Thus, we discover that while the injunction is an enjoining directive, it does not predetermine or overdetermine how one will respond. It cannot guarantee learning. And this is precisely why it is authentically unstable, uncertain, and unpredictable. What is this decisive directive that catches and throws us into learning? Again, we're cautious to address the matter as a phenomena of mediation, and as such, we turn our attention to Socrates and Ions as mediators. However, we must first complete our initial discussion of evocative speech and dwell on the question, how is it with the nothing? Although we have the opportunity to revisit again, re, although we will have the opportunity to revisit it again, for the matter is hardly settled, this question requires some attention because in responding to it, we will have a better sense of the directive that Socrates and Ion are responding to. And so that's where I concluded it. Now, in the original, um, rather when I was editing it, you'll see that I crossed out this section, the last section, and wrote um, a new sentence where I wrote at the end after the sentence, and this precisely is why it is authentically unstable, uncertain, and unpredictable, that is to say the injunction or the enjoining directive, I wrote, herein appears the excessive presencing of being with the evocative questioning that directs the turning to being and initiates learning. So let me say that again. So with the enjoining directive that takes us into the clearing, I said, herein appears the excessive presencing of being with the evocative questioning that directs the turning to being and initiates learning. So the evocative questioning that directs the turning to being and initiates learning is precisely um, the way that evocative um, speech appears. So evocative speech as evocative questioning. I think I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at a short 15 minute um, <coughs> uninterpreted um, straightforward reading in part because I gave a sort of preliminary, which I have to say, as I was reading this, I couldn't help but think um, how the paper that I'm working on right now, especially insofar 
um, than the writing I just did on the train just now, where I was talking about um, and writing about rather, where I wrote about uh, something that I've done before, but this idea of rewriting Plato's allegory, The Cave. Um, and this time today, I think I kind of I got somewhere with that that move, um, insofar as I linked it to the power or force of the emancipation, and also um, linked it to what I think is um, a, a, a problem or an error, if you will, in the logic of the, the allegory. Um, all that to say that I concluded, or I'm making the move in the paper, that um, the rewritten allegory would insist that the uh, liberated cave dweller remains in this place uh, outside of the cave. Um, and so it insists, one would have to insist upon that because what I'm arguing is that to the logic of the allegory, um, the, the fault I'm finding in it is that the prisoner, once they have achieved this sort of liberation out of the cave and they contemplate um, the source of all things, the good, uh, somehow returns to their former modality of passivity and docility, right? So that they are easily persuaded to go back down uh, into the cave, um, to return to the cave. And, you know, we can talk about this and interpret this as, well, that's just Plato saying that, you know, the philosopher can't just contemplate being, and the philosopher can't just think for the sake of thinking. They need to be, you know, I mean, uh, engaged in the, the ways of the world. And in fact, it's allegories happening in the Republic, Book 7 of the Republic, and the whole uh, uh, treatise is about, uh, you know, how do we organize um, the best possible political arrangements so that, um, you know, all, all, all can live in that sort of uh, as a proper state, uh, the best state. Um, so, of course, the prisoner uh, now enlightened would have to return um, to the cave because the cave is, and you know, the, either the place of the, po the, the polis, the dwelling of the political, or it's where people need to all be brought out of, so to speak. So, you know, it's understood why Plato's making that move, but what, what my argument at least for the moment, is that, in fact, this place outside of the cave, um, whatever it is, um, is perhaps uh, a place outside of the political. For a Han Arendt, that is the proper place of philosophy at any rate. And I have consistently wanted to make the argument that philosophy, um, I have a sort of a conservative approach to philosophy, which is to say that it... Um, you know, is is apolitical in the sense that art is, is apolitical. Um, that is to say, it, if there is a political implication or normative uh, ethical implication of the practice of philosophy, so be it. But it can't be guided by that as a sort of a telos. You know, you don't do philosophy so that in the end you can come up with a political theory or policies or practices uh, that are, um, <clears throat> yeah, just you, <coughs> you don't come up with policies or practices. At the end of the day, that's not the point of philosophy. Um, and so the, um, this meditation, though, and talking about the clearing and being moved out into the clearing um, is really just exactly uh, the point I'm making uh, in my writing today. So in a certain sense, I remain um, where I was <laughs> and I am, uh, continuing to think through um, the meaning of philosophy and um, the relationship between being and learning and being... Um, moved into the clearing. Um, so, well, look, it's 20 minutes already, so in the end, I went to about 20 minutes. So thanks for um, tuning in, and uh, tune in again for the next uh, meditation.